Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I thought I'd share with you some results from my first two galaxies of galaxy season. It only took about three months given the uh, weather delays. And so I finally, I don't know if I'm finished or not, but at least I'm done for now. I need to move on to some other targets. But anyway, this is the two galaxies I started imaging way back in beginning of March, I think. NGC 3359 and NGC 5907. And I thought I'd share with you some of the things that I learned uh, as part of the updated imaging train and a little bit of the post-processing, but maybe we'll do the post-processing at a later time. First of all, let's take a look at a little video as I give a tour of the setup outside. Finally getting a uh, decent night of no clouds anyway. It's been fairly humid, so the dew has been a bit of a problem. Also, it's been a bit windy, uh, which means even though I tried to use the dew shield to <laughs> forestall some of the dew, that was actually doing more harm than good from a uh, seeing perspective because that thing just acts like an even larger sail than the than this telescope already is. I've made a couple of changes uh, to the setup uh, for convenience purposes. For example, I added a large rubber band here uh, that's double wrapped around the uh, OTA and it holds fairly securely this connector for the uh, environmental sensor and then I just plug into it back here so that's a, a nice add. The primary reason for adding it though was to put in a, a uh, tie here, a, a kind of a uh, bendable wire tie which allows the uh, cable bundle to go through a line that's the axis of uh, the deck axis of rotation so that there's no uh, stretching due to deck motion anyway of the uh, cables from from here on back. Um, not using the focuser for the recent video. We had the issue with the binding so I'm back to manual focus. Works fairly well. Prefer to have a automatic focuser but anyway you gotta do what you gotta do. Uh, another thing I've added is this handle. I've had to add on in order to make use of the handle, I had to add on the bar for the guide scope, which I don't need, and the guide ring supports, took off the guide ring, guide scope rings. Uh, but I bought this little handle for about 15 bucks, maybe 20 bucks. Um, pretty good. Uh, it's, uh, it's plastic. It allows you to select an accent color. So in this case, since I have uh, Celestron equipment, I've selected the orange accent color. But what it does, it allows me to carry in one hand the OTA, and it's centered right above the center of mass of the, of the OTA. So it's very easy to walk in and out of doors with the, uh, safely with the OTA by simply carry with a simple uh, handle. Another change that I've made is I've trying the dew strap back here behind the cell i first tried it uh, wrapped around the cell um, that did not solve all the problems at least for that one night that i tried it i tried it located here and i've had mixed results one night i sh it uh i i got completely dewed over in a few hours and then last night probably thanks to excess wind it uh, kept the dew off it seemed to all night anyway and so I don't know that I have a good solution it may be that uh, having two of these straps might be the the solution and hence the reason I was going to use the dew shield but again high wind and dew shield did not uh, a good pair make I noticed that uh, I had to take out this uh, nose extension off the guide camera, the ASI-174 Mini, which was confusing to me because I had it attached and it was in focus at the time. And then I went back and did imaging with the uh, smaller refractors and finally came back. So I wondered why it is I had to take this off to get focus. And then with my extended downtime due to weather, uh, I've noticed that I left out this ring that goes between the off-axis guider and the filter wheel. And so, of course, if I move the camera sensor back by this amount, about almost 12 millimeters, then I'll have to have the nose ring back onto the nose extension, back onto the ASI-174, so I can keep them at the same distance from the sensor to the center of the off-axis guider and from the prism up to the uh, guiding sensor. So that's a change I'll make, but I can't make that until I'm finished doing all of the imaging for these two targets, my first two targets of galaxy season, which have taken for flipping ever. 
So the current setup is actually quite a bit different from the last time that I was out doing some serious imaging in a galaxy season. Going forward, this will be my setup as near as I can tell uh, for, the, for the foreseeable future. Once again, in galaxy season, I'm still using my CGEM mount, and I'm, still go I'm now going back to the SCT. However, I have made a number of changes to the setup other than those two original pieces of equipment. I've implemented or added a Celestron focus motor. I've added a do not strap to uh, for do prevention before I just took my chances and chances didn't often play out well this time of year in the uh, early galaxy season. I swapped out the T2i for an ASI 1600mm plus the filter wheel so I went from a a one-shot color to a now a filter wheel based system where you have to combine obviously the the pictures you take from each filter into a color image and I swapped out the guide scope and uh, with my with an off-axis guider I had the off-axis guider for two years before I decided to use it because of what I anticipated would be the frustration of trying to find a guide star in a very small field of view by offered by a long focal length SCT and uh, we'll talk about that uh, and and the uh, how difficult it is or is not to use the off-axis guider. That was part of my uh, new learning experience here with this with this altered setup. Uh, fortunately, ZWO has since come out with an even more sensitive guide camera with a larger sensor. So this ASI 174 is more sensitive. It has larger pixels, which is, contributes to its sensitivity, but it also has a four times larger sensor. So you can see four times the area, uh, the sky area. So it makes finding a guide start a little bit easier, not a whole lot, uh, but a little bit easier. And of course, because I switched to the ASI 1600, I've had to switch out uh, give up on backyard EOS and now I've switched to mostly to astrophotography tool although I am gaining more and more interest in in uh, trying out Nina and I'm sure that will happen in the near term here I'm used still using PhD 2 although that code has evolved quite a bit now there's a predictive periodic error correction algorithm that really does help I think to tame some of the mechanical induced gear induced pointing error that my mount in particular has there are more expensive mounts in uh, obviously with with uh, higher mechanical machining tolerances where that where gear induced pointing error gear motion induced pointing error will not be as significant but it's nice to know that phd2 has an option now for those of us with mounts that do have a good bit of uh, gear motion induced pointing error and and i think that that predictive PEC algorithm is actually a great addition to, to PHD2. And of course, I'm still using PixInsight. Back in 2015, 16, 17, I was new to PixInsight and just barely learning how to work with it using one-shot color images. Now there's a whole new set of learning curves that go with dealing with filters. And um, so I'm climbing, climbing the uh, additional learning curves associated with that. But basically, this is the change in the setup that I'm using now for galaxy season as opposed to what I was using the last time I did any serious imaging for galaxy season. Dew prevention is a big issue, uh, particularly for me. This plot here comes from the ultimate power, Pegasus Astro Ultimate Power Box 2. And uh, it's one of the things I really like about the uh, Ultimate Power Box is that it does save these graphs for later inspection and go back and do some diagnosis and figure out what happened or what didn't happen and why. And so it's nice to have these these plots available. Uh, Nina is has adopted the uh, Ultimate Power Box as as part of a an, an ASCOM switch uh, piece of equipment, and you can start up the uh, ultimate power box within nina however the interface is not as nice also you there is no provision for saving off these graphs and i do like saving off the the graphs for for later use and finally uh, currently in nina the temperature that comes or is available through the ultimate power box and its environmental sensor is not made available uh, to the focuser for initiating uh, auto uh, auto focusing procedure based on temperature uh, which is unfortunate because the Celestron focus motor I'm using with the uh, S with this SET does not have it, its own dedicated temperature sensor so I would like to see the temperature coming out of the environmental sensor for the ultimate power box to be made available to 
the uh, focuser algorithm so that it can use temperature variations as recorded by the environmental sensor to to trigger an auto focusing event anyway maybe i'm sure that's coming nina changes every night so uh, lots of good improvements coming down the pike with with nina in this case i've got the 33 inch circumference do not do strap uh, put on the sct just behind the cell the first time i as i noted in the video the first time i i did this i had it mounted across the cell and it's closer to the corrector plate at that time, but there's also more thermal mass, and the top and bottom rings or bars uh, prevent uh, full contact with the dew strap and the metal body. So it's fairly inefficient up there, and I found that it didn't work unconditionally. So I'm trying it back here behind the cell. The advantage here is that you can slip it under the top and bottom uh, rails, and so the, the dew strap has full circumferential contact with the tube unfortunately it's a little bit farther distant behind the tube so it's got to generate uh, enough heat to propagate out and and heat up the corrector plate which is challenging uh, under the best of circumstances this is a i won't say a typical night but it's fairly typical night this time of year in this case it's may uh, 2nd may 3rd and so in this plot you can see the temperature recorded by the environmental sensor and a calculated dew point provided by the ultimate power box and you can see obviously they're they're getting closer now the way i work with this system the ultimate power box has an automatic an automated system for triggering or controlling the power to a dew strap and I find that that works fairly well with a small aperture refractor, but I wasn't going to risk it with this large aperture SCT. So the minute I turn on the system, even though doing is not a, a concern right off the bat, I turn on the power to the dew strap to basically full power right off the bat so it can start, hopefully, heating up the tube and hopefully having that heat uh, propagate over and into the corrector plate. Uh, however, I find that it doesn't always help and in fact when I've the corrector plate in this case was doing up when I get within about five degrees C the dew point gets within about five degrees C of the external temperature so uh, once that happens obviously you're dead in the water so in this case uh, the dew strap was not sufficient did not produce sufficient heat uh, to to prevent dew from forming on the corrector plate. It's a very challenging situation, a large corrector plate, and you're more, you're, because it's larger, the source of heat is farther away, so it takes a good bit of heat to conduct down into the corrector plate and prevent dewing. So this is, um, I'm afraid I found this to be all too typical in my experience imaging these two targets. Now, there are times where the dew point and the temperature are greater than 5 degrees C apart and remain that way, and then I don't get the doing. However, <laughs> unfortunately, in this case, the imaging session was stopped due to poor guiding on the west side of the meridian. I initially started out on the east side and then s switched targets to one that was had just passed the the meridian and that was on the west side of the meridian. And I'll show you a, a guiding graph for what's going on here, but it just goes to show you that even though some nights you might be uh, you might find your imaging session terminated because of dew and some nights your imaging session is terminated because of some mechanical problems and uh, as I'll show you also it can be terminated because of some electrical problems here's a couple of other cases different nights once again the story is the same the the corrector plate dews over uh, when I get within about five degrees of the dew point the outside temperature gets within five degrees of the dew point, and then there's just no no going back beyond that. There was one uh, what I thought at the time was an odd event, and that's this case here. In this case, there, the dew point was did not get within the uh, five degrees of the outside temperature, but there was this interesting anomalous jump in the humidity. After that, I noticed a kind of a, uh, a cloud, if you will, forming over the image to the point where I had to stop doing any, uh, any imaging because it was just, it's almost like a fog had set in somewhere on the corrector plate, the mirrors, the internal uh, filters, whatever. Finally dawned on me after a few minutes of this, oh yeah, I put out my telescope and forgot to turn off the automatic uh, lawn sprinkler system. 
Uh, so yeah, I watered my scope. That's not a good thing to do. That one you, you I don't know about dew prevention, but stupidity prevention is something we might be able to 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 accomplish. I did confirm one thing though, and that's you, watering your scope does not, in fact, produce a larger focal length. It just produces a wetter scope, and it pretty much terminates the uh, the imaging period that day. Yeah, so that was great. Um, guiding performance. One of my biggest concerns. In going to the off-axis guider, and, th- and the thing that made me hold off going to the off-axis guider for the longest time was the concern of being able to find a guide star. Now, there's a, a video I have up on the website showing a procedure to, that I've used to do some pre-planning using Stellarium, and uh, that gives me the information I need to set the orientation of the camera and the guide camera so that there, I can have some confidence that there's a guide star out there when I get out there. And that worked very well. Uh, meanwhile, uh, there was the hope that a imp- implementing or using the, the uh, Alpha-Axis Guider would actually improve my guiding for two reasons. One, when you take off the guide scope, which is obviously sitting on top of your uh, OTA, and you replace it with the off-axis guider, which is down at the center line of the OTA, you dramatically reduce the mass moment of inertia of the system, which should make the torque motors that operate the RA uh, axis in particular more responsive to guiding commands. So in theory, you are you have a more responsive uh, system with a lower mass moment of inertia offered by using a, a uh, off-axis guider. The second advantage you have is that your guide camera is now looking through the long focal length of your imaging uh, scope, and as a result, the image scale of the guide camera is now much closer to the image scale of your guide of your imaging camera, and so that should give a better resolution of the star, and therefore the centroid finding algorithm should do a better job. You should be able to detect motion sooner, and with a lower mass moment of inertia, you should be able to make com- uh, implement commands for better guiding. Yeah, that didn't work. Uh, I didn't think. I didn't perceive any big difference improvement in guiding. I don't regret going to the off-axis guider. I do like it. And now that I have a procedure for setting it up ahead of time, the potential frustration of being outside in the dark finding a guide star is eliminated. So all that can be done during the day before you even take the scope outside. And so that's good. Um, And I'll continue using the off-axis guider. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to keep using it just for its reduction in weight and cumbersomeness of carrying the scope with a carrying the whole overall system with a guide scope on top Uh, one thing and i've noted this before in earlier videos is when i start my general procedure is to when i start guiding uh, i will set the system guiding meanwhile i'm cooling the camera and maybe making some edits to the imaging plan uh, just allowing the the deck axis to drift not with no control no no guiding going on so i have the deck guiding off and i just let the system kind of drift in whichever way it wants to drift in this case it drifted to the south and then when i was ready to start doing the imaging i just shifted to uh, guide mode north and from there on in the only corrections sent to the mount in the deck direction were in the north direction and it would want to drift south, but a little bit of drift south would be met with a correction to the north, and that way you don't have to deal with any backlash, and I found this to be fairly effective. And so over this three-hour period of time, I got some excellent, for me, uh, guiding in, in this mount, some excellent guiding, uh, and that, that worked out well. However, when I switched to the west side of the meridian, I began seeing this kind of behavior, and I I don't know what the real source is. There's a couple of ideas. I tested out some motion in the morning and found that the possibility that there could be some some cable snags or some stretching of some cables that might have caused this kind of behavior. Now, here's the dreaded return of the no response 17 error. You always hate when you have everything's working in your favor, the moon's not out, it's not too windy, seeing conditions are great, you're getting, for you, good, excellent guiding, and then all of a sudden, guiding stops. And in particular, the RA axis starts taking off doing its uh, periodic error uh, tracking, of course, with the the worm gear. And, uh, yeah, 
you just you you no longer have control of the mount the the uh, digital display and communication between astrophotography tool and the mount ceases and it just registers as zeros in terms of which way is the mount pointing obviously phd2 can't talk to the mount or send commands and so yeah this is this stopped me at least on one or two nights the uh, celestron website and look up the no response 17 they have this little blurb here and the key thing i, I found in here is they go through a number of different ca potential causes uh one of them that kind of really sticks out with me is that the uh, the error is likely, uh, most commonly, uh, caused by insufficient power. And it could be that my arrangement, trying to power the mount off of the uh, ultimate power box using a longer than recommended cable. It's it's thicker, but longer than recommended cable. It could be that I'm just on the uh, the ragged edge of the power capabilities of this of this setup i may have to go back and 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 use the ac adapter in the future all right now some results this is ngc 3359 on the left and 5907 on the right if you look up ngc 5907 in stellarium you're not going to find it 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 only gives it to you as 5906 but i think the true galaxy designation is 5907 not 5906 ng 3359 had about almost 18 hours of imaging i'd like to have had more uh, imaging time i didn't pull out the detail that i would have liked to have seen in this galaxy and i would like to have had a little more color in fact i would have also liked to have had some ha data but difficulties with the weather mechanical and electrical issues i finally just decided to to uh, give up on, on this target pair so that I can move on to some larger targets with more detail available in the field of view. So I didn't get HA. May, one day I may have to go back and tackle this target again. It's a, it is a bit small, uh, even in, in the field of view of the, the uh, 9.25 SCT, but I think there is more data there to get, and I'm a little disappointed in what I have. Now, these are my first few attempts at at doing the image processing here and usually I find when I go back and revisit the post-processing I get a better result um, but I, I do feel like I'm fairly hamstrung with respect to NGC 3359 I don't have the best quality data I like the results of the 5907 Galaxy a little bit better uh, there's some good uh, dark lanes visible here with some decent detail I got a little bit more uh, luminous data out of this, not much, but I also got more color data. Mostly it was an improvement in color data. And while I, I included HA, I think you could leave out the HA data for this edge on spiral and you'd be perfectly fine. I think the, it'd be much better to have the HA data for the uh, face on uh, spiral galaxy of the NGC 3359 than, on the, than for the edge on uh, spiral galaxy of 5907. I think going forward, I probably won't capture HA data for edge on uh, spiral galaxies. Instead, I'll reserve that effort for face on spirals, where I think you probably have a better chance of seeing some, uh, some visual benefit. Let's take a closer look at these two galaxies just for the torture of it. In this case, um, like I said, I don't think I'm getting, I'm certainly not getting the kind of detail out of the, out of the arms that I would like to have gotten. Um, I'm a little more pleased with the detail in, in NGC 5907, but again, there's the, the emphasis or the focus is on the, the dust lanes uh, that, are, that are visible in here. So it's an interesting galaxy, um, but yeah, it probably could have been done a little bit better. Well, one of the things that was most scary uh, and kept me from using the Celestron off-axis guider for a long time was just the pain in the neck that I assumed uh, finding guide stars would be and indeed uh, it would be a, a pain in the neck if it weren't for Stellarium. I found Stellarium to be extremely useful particularly because it it has uh, the the view it offers the view of the off-axis guider what it sees and so through some effort and I recommend that you go back and look at my if you're interested in this sort of thing that video I have called Galaxy Imaging Session Planning and OAG Setup that procedure I outlined in there worked very well. I need to do a better job of, of setting the orientation of the guide camera and the imaging camera, and I bought an, a, a digital angle gauge uh, to, to try to do a better job. We'll talk about that when my, 
when I start doing planning for the next pair of galaxies. Removal of the guy scope and corresponding reduction in weight and mass moment of inertia basically were, had no significant effect on the guiding performance. Uh, neither did the improvement in the image scale for the guide camera relative to the image scale of the uh, imaging camera. Uh, so, yeah, that was not a big uh, improvement. What is certainly true is that my CGM has certain mechanical limits, and it's just not going to get better than that. It can get worse, and poor seeing conditions will make it worse, but little things like uh, reducing the mass moment of inertia here or changing the image scale out uh, by using the off-axis guider, those things were basically no different. I saw no different effectively no different guiding from this heavyweight system than I do from my lightweight Red Cat 51 system. Do prevention. Well, I don't know that prevention is the right word. Uh, maybe I, I delayed it a bit. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but I think it's more of a hope than certainly an achieved goal as far as uh, I witnessed with my large aperture uh, SCT. I've had good luck with this with my uh, smaller aperture refractors. Uh, but uh, when the wind is low and the dew point gets within about 5 degrees of the outside temperature, I'm going to do up. And I don't care where I put the <laughs> where I put the dew strap. It just doesn't matter. I, I turn it on full power and get as much heat out of it as I can. And I'm not winning that battle. So if you come here looking for great advice on how to prevent dew on a large diameter, large aperture SCT, um, you don't have anything for you. It didn't... Uh, didn't uh, didn't work. The no response 17 error is is back and probably most likely caused by some marginal DC power. I need to reconsider seriously going back to the AC adapter that generally worked and I can't remember if I've had that problem before at least when I couldn't directly attribute it to a bad cable. The first iteration of processing the results for these uh, two galaxies are okay. I've, I've had to relearn the uh, approach for processing broadband data. Uh, last time I was doing this sort of thing for RGB type colors, I was using the one-shot color camera. And obviously the, the deep aired image comes to you as, a, as an RGB image right off the bat, though you could break it up into different channels. It comes out as a RGB image, and then you can do your background neutralization and then do your color calibration or photometric color calibration procedure to get to the colors, and then uh, the processing fund begins after that, but you do that in the linear state. Here I'm sort of taking the procedures I've found were fairly successful for uh, the narrow band filters, uh, hydrogen, alpha, oxygen, three, sulfur. So I basically take each filter and process the data, take out the, do a dynamic background extraction for each color filter and HA when I'm doing that and luminance, and then uh, combine them, combine the RGB and HA uh, into an RGB color in the nonlinear state. The, the, using the histogram transformation to take you from the linear state to the nonlinear state is done with the kind of with a built-in as, assumption or objective of putting the peak of the histogram at the quarter point, right? At the 0.25, the 25% of the brightness of the image. And the mere fact that it does every filter is treated that way is, is essentially background neutralization. That's what background neutralization is. It's taking the peak of the histogram for different channels and lining them up. And so that's what the nonlinear step um, does as you as you go to as you use the uh, histogram transformation, you are in effect doing a background neutralization, but also emphasizing, if you will, the brighter parts of the image relative to the darker parts. And so I found that that approach works pretty well. So I'm using that for now on. Maybe one day I'll make a a processing video. Uh, there are so many good ones out there that I can't possibly uh, add much to the discussion there. I think I'm going to move on to NGC 2903 and M51 before I lose them for the year. Okay guys, well thanks for hanging in there. I hope there was something in here that was marginally useful. Um, it certainly wasn't the awesome pictures that I was taking. So clear skies and I'll talk to you later.